So we are a referral lab in terms of uh, samples which are encompassing resistance. So we do all the, you know, the resistibility testing for that, as well as the monitoring of people in treatment to see whether the medication is working or not. Next slide, please. So in Zambia, the main um, instruments which we have for diagnosing TB are the gene expert machines at facility level. Uh, they are capable of uh, determining whether someone has got TB, as well as giving extra information on whether they are resistant. resistant. So TDRC, like I said earlier on, is a referral lab for refractive resistant isolates. So the main work which we do over there is to confirm first and foremost that refractive resistance, as well as carrying out uh, extra um, testing for isomyazid, INH resistance, uh, on the line of assay, as well as um, phenotypic susceptibility testing on the major instrument. Molecular DSTs for second line drug is used to uh, treat drug resistant TB, but this is limited on the line of assay in the sense that, um, well, we are only capable of doing uh, fluoroquinone resistance. And um, as of a couple of years ago, the problem has been that um, new drugs have been introduced for TB management, and those are not catered for under the line of assay or even the expert machine. Next slide, please. So what exactly does the gene expert machine do? So what you have in the gene expert machine is that um, refractive resistance um, is determined by refractive resistance determining region, which is in the RPOP region. And so what you have at certain low side, you have got mutations over there, it confers refractive resistance. Okay, so you have put a number of probes in that gene expert machines, and when you have mutations along those uh, uh, low side, those are the, the the numbers are the positions in, in the gene you have uh, resistance and resistance. Next slide, please. So that is based on what is utilized at facility level. Um, so the two main drugs in TB treatment are refractive and isoniazid. I wanted to give an overview of the exact flow of how things work, especially for INH, because that can only be done at the three referral labs. So basically, people give sputum, uh, you decontaminate it, it goes for culture, you do a phenotypic DST uh, for refabricin and INH. The second line on the molecular side, we extract nucleic acids. We do MTB plus to confirm that's that's on the line from assay to confirm refractive resistance and INH. And um, from that, uh, you will get information on the refractive resistance and acid. I'll just pause over there for a second. Any questions so far? Feel free. Especially for those who have not been in TB. Uh, diagnostics. No questions? I can ask questions? The, the, the previous oh, okay, thank you. The previous, slide. previous slide? Yeah, so, yes. so this slide is, um, shows that the um, knowledge part we can detect the structure and strength of the patient is a fine. Excellent. Actually, I'll, 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 I'll talk a bit more maybe on the on the yeah yeah i'll i think we'll come up briefly on some of the limitations of um of, of uh the expert machines and how whole genome sequencing sort of like comes in so basically when there's a mutation on any one of those sites the probe doesn't bind right and that's how we detect the the oh yeah but an alternative probe which has got that mutation is present and that's what you pick up okay yeah uh, The RD, mm -hmm. RD, 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 RD. resistance determining region. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So the, I think this is what you are talking about. So the issue, what? Um, so this was a study which was done in the previous lab where I was at uh, Stanford University involved in um, a lot of TB research. Uh, you find that the, the gold standard, of course, is your phenotypic. You know, it wouldn't go on drug, would it go on drug. And then you sort of like look at the, the results which are coming off your expert machine. And what was pretty much found in a nutshell, I know it's a busy slide, is that uh, you get some results where expert tells you that it is sensitive. You do the phenotypic DST, you find that it is resistant. Okay, so it, what that basically then says is that there are certain mutations which can give rise to resistance which might be missed by experts, uh, as well as the line for acid. Next slide. So in the late 1995, 1998, ah, sorry. Um, Previously? Yes. Okay. Um, this context, when you say expert, are we also including the outliers, or maybe the outliers that we get around? So the same, I think it's, 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 I think it's a bit more sensitive in, in terms of picking it up, yes. but the markers are the markers. Are the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sure, uh, no problem. Very good. <laughs> so um, the line for assay, which part can that be? So the line for assay, what you basically have is that um, you do a PCR mm -hmm. across those. Um, uh, drug resistance defining genes for rifampicin and INH. And then you have got a strip where you put a probe, uh, where, where you've got uh, oligos uh, impreg um, impregnated, impregnated on, on, onto the strips. And so if we can just go back to the, that, um, oh, no, sorry, that, uh, yeah. yeah, over there. Okay. So if it is, if that's the wild type, if it is complementary to your sample, then it binds, and then hybridization, you see a band. So almost like an HIV strip. Um, okay. So you have uh, each band has got uh, mutations, uh, has got oligos which represent particular mutations. So when you look at that banding pattern, you then determine whether it's resistant or sensitive to the drug. So it's a conventional PC. It's a conventional, it's a, it's a conventional PC. Oh, yeah, it's a conventional PC underlying problem. And then you just see whether a anyway. sample is uh, complementary to either the wild type or the mutant. Yeah. Mm. So, no, I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, a lot changed when the whole genome sequencing of uh, Mycobacterium like tuberculosis was determined. And uh, from that time, a lot has happened. It was sequenced, it was annotated. Um, a lot of the experiments were done, which were building evidence on what particular genes do. It's still an ongoing process, but a lot has arisen from that, including um, your RPOB genes and other stuff as well. So Whereas uh, RPOB were just looking at that short piece of fragment with the whole genome sequencing, all of a sudden we're looking at the entire complement of 4 million that has changed. It's now 532, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, so 4, 4 million, 532 bases. So each and every one of those in terms of the reference has now been determined. So that in itself presented a lot of opportunities in terms of identifying mutations which can hold the resistance in, in tuberculosis stream. Next slide, please. So we have heard about sequencing at, um, and there are different technologies. One of them is Oxford Nanopore Sequencing, which are going to be learning about. The other major platform which is used is Illumina, uh, is based on the Illumina platform. Um, it is different from Oxford in the sense that uh, Oxford, you, you have these very long reads which are brilliant for aligning 
in a nominal, we sort of like fragment it into shorter pieces, mm -hmm. and then we see it. So if this is the fragment, which you do, the fragment which arises, so the 4.4 million, you chop it up into 600 base pair, into 600 uh, basis long fragments, and then you see, let's say, 150 bases in the forward and in the reverse. Okay, and then what you do after that is. You then use your software to align these ones to a reference, and then that's how you then compare the basis along each position, each position to see whether it works like Okay. Yes, please. So this is just an example of uh, how. Um, so these green blue lines for simplicity those are the fragments which you have sequenced and then you have aligned them to your reference the reference is properly annotated so you know what each gene is and then you know what uh, each uh, base is at any particular position along that four million four hundred uh, four million uh, genome length of the reference questions karen if you don't ask, I'll ask. <laughs> you better ask. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So this alignment is done in the This is to so view the alignment. The, yeah, this is just this is just for viewing the alignment, the the number of bioinformatic tools which you can use to do the alignment. Uh, be that for Illumina, be that UA is, uh, is a common one. Um, then there are others, but I think BWA is the most widely used. So before you get to this, I think you will discuss a bit more the number of steps which you need to do that you see, look at how good your reads are and so on and so forth. So this is almost towards the end. You're seeing how it is looking. So where the reads are aligned to the reference, you see that where you don't see them aligning, it means that it's not present uh, as far as the reference is concerned. You'll see with nano four, and we'll show you later on. With the nano, with the Illumina, if you can see that they're in the really small thin stacks. With nano four, because you have longer reads, you get it's more of kind of blankets almost. Yeah. So they look similar but different, and we'll show you kind of the, the comparison. Yeah. And each one of them, you should also realize, has got advantages and disadvantages. So they the two actually complement each other. Democracies. Yes. So, in terms of TB, MTB, the reference genome is uh, H37RV, and that's what has been um, curated in terms of uh, each and every uh, base position from one to the very end. So now, in terms of what we've been doing, there are a number of questions. Uh, like I said earlier on, we are in a period whereby new drugs, especially, have been introduced in terms of managing drug resistant uh, TTB. Um, on the ground, pretty much, we had limited uh, techniques of determining. Uh, so, so as, as an example, you put someone on four drugs. Two months later, they're still positive. Which one do you remove? What do you replace it with? Okay, you are in a system whereby uh, I will tell you that um, pretty much uh, it was the quinoline which you could only test for, and you find that they are sensitive to it. If I'm on one drug which is sensitive and the other ones are resistant, I'll continue being resistant. So you, you end up having, like in our situations, people who have been on treatment for over two years and they are failing to come back here. Yeah. And, 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 and that's the major issue. Um, so um, we brought in some uh, phenotypic testing, still being rolled out, takes a bit longer to get that result, you know, sometimes up to six months if it does happen. So the uh, major problem is that these patients, remember, are not housed in hospital. And so they're given medication, they go back to the communities. So I'm still positive, it means that I will cough on you. 
you have TB for the very first time, and it will not be sensitive, it will still be the resistant one. Okay, so hence this new technology and how it is coming in. So in terms of um, uh, next generation sequencing, these are the main things which we are interested in at uh, TDRC on behalf of MOH in terms of what we want to pick up. Definitely pick up more information on the drug resistance. Um, as that drug resistance is developing, are we capable of seeing when it is starting to develop? Um, so, in, and then uh, because of that, we then also want to find out, do we have a drug resistance epidemic developing in country? And um, how are the different strains related to each other? We do some phylogenetic and epidemiological studies and basically incorporate all of that into the national uh, surveillance and that uh, MRH. Yeah. So um, I also think what you can do with your parents and with the engineering. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And with uh, this technique, you can literally um, tell differences within 10 base pairs out of the whole COVID. And that is what determines, uh, I think, the current standards of determining a true cluster. And that is important in terms of identifying hotspots where you might have maybe a drug-resistant um, outbreak happening. I'll pick an example of uh, the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Everything was tested over a 10-year period. The drug versus MDRTB became the dominant form. But that 400 US dollars per person, so very expensive. Okay, so this information important in terms of um, managing the epidemic and you know bring it under control before it goes out of hand. Huh? So it's an ongoing process, okay, with more uh, lab work being done by different research institutions, facilities, what they do at UTH, what we do at UTH uh, in London, et cetera, et cetera. The database is continuously being updated. And um, yeah, there are certain drugs which have been well characterized, especially Rifampicin and INH. And um, in some cases, you're even finding, like for PZA, that the molecular techniques are actually better than the phenotypic testing. Okay, and so, yeah. I think what's really useful about sequencing and getting sequencing out to the more widespread use of the surveillance is that we will start to pick up all of these new genes that we might not have seen before, because if you're only doing things, if it's, if that's something that you might know it's resistant to the next but you don't know why. And so getting everybody here to learn sequencing is going to help to sort of do more sequencing and TV and then hopefully find more of these not the drugs something like that so that's one of those which then builds into yeah. your whole uh, PhD projects as well because you find that look um the data is saying that this is supposed to be sensitive of the expert and he uh, but uh, for these a thousand strains and they all have this rigid this could be it I can do uh, revert it back to wild type test it again does it revert back to being sensitive and the like? And now, okay, definitely, this is uh, uh, resistance uh, determining mutation. So that's what I think. Let's see a question. No, not everybody gets uh, development. Okay, so typically, when um, let's say you have TB and your drug resistance, the first thing which we jump at is you are not taking your medication properly and uh, you are skipping doses and the like, and therefore we have developed drug resistance, right? And yeah, but uh, in the past, um, it was said that when uh mtb develops drug resistance um its fitness to transmit is diminished and um, therefore 
uh, transmission of drug resistance strains was was viewed as not something which is not so big. But with this technology now, and um, I think even previous ones like um, your DNA fingerprinting, they did show that you have compensatory mutations which we established that with this to translate. So you have never had TB before. About what drug resistant TB and I cough on you, what you get is a drug resistant isolate from the very beginning, even without taking any drugs whatsoever. So that is also some of the major advantages of um, uh, NGS next generation sequencing in the sense that you can also subsequently start to determine whether the transmission of drug resistant strains is what is actually causing the rise in your drug resistant TB cases as opposed to people are not taking a medication properly. Because when you think about it, that will impact the whole control strategy. It's not that those nurses who are not doing their jobs. It's just that we have got these drug resistant isolates people should have been doing more uh, NGS so that everyone is on the So yeah, HDS interested now in interviewing the uh, DST profiles um, uh, and uh, see what are those mutations like I mentioned any of that put an association with resistance. Next slide. Yeah. So this algorithm is from South Africa, but pretty much it represents what is uh, happening in in Zambia as well. So you have got that you give your, your patient, give your sample, expert comes to us, we do our microscopy, we do our extraction, we do our line from assay and our phenotypic testing. Typically in Zambia as well, we do not test for PZA, if that butyl and the like, that's, we, we just don't uh, do it. I think what I wanted to mention about this is that when they looked at um, their um, MDR isolates, they found that a significant number of them were actually resistant to PZA and so and some of those drugs are part of the, the concoction which we give them. So we are drinking something which doesn't work, and uh, yeah, we don't, we don't test for it. Next slide. So um, one of the advantages of um, Illumina-based sequencing is so under UTH, TDRC, and uh, CDL, each patient who is um, refractory resistant, from the time they're determined, samples are sent on a monthly basis to us and we do cultures to see whether the treatment is working or not. So you can have like some months whereby, okay, it's um, it's working, 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 month four, month five, resistant, phenotypically and the like. So depending on, um, so the resistance doesn't happen You, have, you start with a single cell or a small number of cells and then they multiply and then the population starts to change from your sensitive and then it can be 1%, then it, after some months it becomes 10% and so on and so forth. So with um, sequencing on the Illumina platform, uh, you can see both alleles from your sequence reads, whereby you are able to say that, ah, okay, at this time point, the dapalin is actually starting to fail before it becomes the dominant clone, which then from the clinician's perspective gives you an earlier time point to change the drug and then put something which is a bit more, which they are sensitive to. Yeah, so I could ask you. I just have one more. Yeah. Do you ever um, let 
how a patient can provide this drug with a risk of every drug in existence in the hospital. If one is sort of a blackout, then that means about five or six years, too much time. Another is about the whole persistence, so I'm in the analysis. So INH is one such drug actually, and you do have uh, people who are not that good at metabolizing it. And the side effect, and I think the other thing about these uh, drugs is that the side effects can be quite drastic. The ones which they removed um, the aminoglycosides were causing permanent deafness. Okay, and um, they were also a bit tricky to, to monitor in terms of their efficacy and the like. So currently, that is still a gap. It is something I think we've been discussing uh, amongst the three institutions that we uh, need to do so that we get more information on that uh, as well. But currently, in Zambia, no. But it is something which we are thinking of incorporating in terms of um, uh, understanding the whole um, drug resistance um, landscape of TB in Zambia. How do you figure that? Right. So you 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 measure the the, the drug level the, the drug levels or the metabolites of the drug levels. Uh, you know what you'd expect if it's properly being metabolized. Yeah. And like using so what? your pharmacokinetics. Yeah. yeah. So you use pharmacokinetics studies. Um, you bring in the patient, for example. And then you have them take the drug at a set time point, and then you take measurements of the drug in their blood at time points following that. So you say time zero, they took the drug. Uh, our four, this was the concentration of drug in their blood. Our six, our eight, and you know, before. so then you can you know kind of tell how the drug is being broken down over time. So some people will break it down faster. You know, some people. You know, so or even the products of what you'd expect at a certain time point, like yes. uh, I think we have a separate drug and this time and that. So you measure those different things as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 Um, we're we're actually doing a study where we are we're doing that in um in adults. So we have um uh, adults on an intensive arm where they get uh, three times the concentration of rivampicin, um, twice the dosage of isoniazide, and then another one where they're getting standards standards um, treatment and we are doing pharmacokinetic studies on them to see what the drug concentration is at different time points um yes so so yes that's you you would do that so the idea is if you find those differences um you then you know now go down to like what pathway is metabolizing the drug figure out what um um mutations in those genes are there so then, you know, ideally, when the patient's starting treatment, you can test for those things, and you would know, okay, this one's likely to be a fast metabolizer, slow metabolizer. These are the doses that we're going to give. But obviously, all of that comes with work that hopefully you guys are going to do it. Um, following following this talk and these these training um, 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 opportunities. Maybe, maybe. Maybe um, no, 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 what a talk. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing so, is wrong. All questions are fine. Are there any genetic studies that are being done? Post genetics? Yeah, do it. I know that they were. Yeah, they are in Zambia. In Zambia right now. Sure. I'm most genetic. Sure. Not to my knowledge. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't no, know. But, but, but you see, that's the opportunity which now has arisen with all of these sequencing technologies which have been uh, rolled out. So I think we are literally going to be limited by our imaginations yeah, exactly. in terms of uh, all of those things. But we have the technology now. Absolutely. So in terms of, yes. Okay. yes. 
You can. Yeah. So, so that that was uh as an you team is what you guys do you guys the host the map. No, you do also have the map as for the host, that's what I I mean. Yeah. Right? Okay, so the, 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 ah, what are you yeah. talking about the the, <laughs> the bug or the host? <laughs> so in this case it's the host genetics. Yes. Yeah, which I'm gonna do there. Yeah. Oh. See that's the starting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the host genetics. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yes. this line. Oh, the previous yeah. one? Okay. Um, from practice, I'm a cross case where the mother is a um, TV, the TV, mm -hmm. and then uh, we do the neurotic PSP, we succeed in the baby, very young baby, um, has to be actually uh, came from the mother, but can't resist the TV. Mm -hmm. So, trying to explain. Um, how the baby will not have resistance once the mother is back to center. So, assumption we try to use this to interpret this scenario right? by thinking maybe the mother can be having a delay um, kind of stimulation and then um, the resistance bites about the cost of the baby, whilst the that's not the assumption. I don't know, is there a better way to study this and to make sure I understand? That? And you get all of those answers from yeah. exactly what you're yes. going to be doing. So yes. remember, uh, if you in sequence, the mothers and the child, you will be able to see the, uh, the relationship here, yeah, the relationship. And you should also bear in mind that. Um, you possibly find that most of the people who have TPs are in the poor communities and the more crowded communities. Public transport is a, is a big thing. In June, our so called winter, all the windows are rolled up and stuff like that. The immunity is way less than the, than the parents. So, someone in the meeting bus crossing the line, maybe we'll, 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 get, we'll get it, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's different scenarios which can arise. Are there, are there different drug treatment regimes for adults and very small babies here? Because would it maybe also cause selective pressure for resistance to come out? So that's, like a, a, so that's like a diagnosis yeah. where you find that the, uh, the, the mother is sensitive, uh, that diagnosis even before the treatment begins, that the mother, the child is resistant, but the mother has got sensitive TB. Yeah. So that's even before you, you put them on any. Carol, the next part of the diet on the parents future, and then when they come to the culture facilities at UTH and TDSC, we well, they need some culture to be culture them, they do extra tests. With respect to the same way, you see a lot of agreement between the uh, expert. It's only in a very few cases that we find that um, there's a discrepancy between your expert result and your community test results. Single, they're doing single. Yeah. So, on your phenotypic, definitely watch what 
noise on it that was susceptible. If I'm going to some yeah, 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 yeah. From brain if I'm brain is on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. yeah, yeah. So, so, so before that, but the only way you know that it's a mixed thing in bicycle, you will not know yes. uh, without doing the uh, sequencing. Yeah. And so, Even between X and, and that's the reason why everything, which is one of the reasons why we even do a line from assay to confirm the refamping resistance and the phenotypic DST. Because there are instances, let's say, that if you think about it, you can have a test kit which does not have a particular mutation incorporated in it. If that mutation is going to cause resistance, then that test will give it uh, uh, a negative result for mm -hmm. resistance. So we do um, so we do multiple tests. Well, prior to this, especially, we're doing multiple tests. Uh, to confirm that thing, and then the ultimate one, of course, is um, a phenotype, uh, is a phenotypic testing. Now, TB can take up to forty-two days before it becomes uh, positive. Yeah. So um, these uh, sequencing uh, techniques now things are moving on to. I think we're approaching. It has been demonstrated by Lindsay that you can sequence directly from sputum and the like. It's still being affected to be made better, but I think that's where we are we are we are heading to. And then, with a because yeah. you need a smaller amount of Mouse, DNA yeah, with absolutely. Nanopore, as we'll find out, because you have to do it from native DNA because PCR it it doesn't really work, and I'll we'll show you that later. You have to have quite a large, I mean, the minimum amount of the kit we're going to show you is five nanograms per microliter. And obviously, if you have somebody who has a very low amount of TV in those sputum, then you're probably not going to get enough DNA from that to run it on that. Level. So, again, like people were saying, there are advantages on advantages and disadvantages for the difference with sequencing techniques. So, yeah, it's definitely doable, it's just it's getting there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, there are kits, so there, there are different kits for knowing or anything there. With knowing what we're doing, what we've been developing, it's a fragmented kit. So, the idea is to try and make cost effective, but also easy to use. Sequencing magnified money because RA is something for people in a disability that we don't necessarily have by the participants. So, the kit that we've been using is the part of the Kit, so that we need to take the DNA. We tested the PCR version out, but whether you like it showed me when you get more sort of um file and it's stuff getting records, you know, you get those great gaps. It just doesn't for some reason the PCR stop. Yeah, so you get that to get a lot more holes. And I'll show you I've got a, a really good example of the RPO BG with the native kit, you get it all the way across, you get your sort of pancakes that are flattened across it. With a, a PCR one, you just get a stack of pancakes and the rest is missing. So if the resistance snip is in a bit where you have not then you're going to be with a you know, So, yeah. So the other thing which you have to also bear in mind is that the MTB gene has what these repeats <laughs> sequences. Which can be massive in size. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, I told you that the read length, uh, basically, now for Illumina is um, uh, 75 to let's say 300 mm -hmm. base pairs. So, and the fragment, the total fragment, let's say if it's 600 base pairs long, and then the repeat size is 1,500. Mm -hmm. 
where is this street going to map? So it will be an unmapped street and you can leave a gap over there. You know, Oxford Nanopools can be up to 400,000 page cash loans so that you can spread that all repeat size and you will have information on that. databases are getting better and better with the labs workbench and phenotypic you know, has to continue as of now until we reach that point huh? so but what we're doing now is that we're having more associations between mutations and phenotypic you know, for more and more drugs previously it was really centered around refamicin and iron age doing that band while the land for phenotypic in terms of what we're now doing but it's becoming better and better so um, I think it's important that you choose the right database which you're using to um, to understand the mutations which you're having from your sequencing and putting everything into context. And yeah, thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So um, also besides the databases, um, there are now um, more pipelines which make it a bit more easier to do your bioinformatica analysis. Uh, previously, you literally had to do everything by uh, uh, command line each step. This will do the alignment. This will do, these are bad sequences. I need to do some trimming and filtering. Um, this is what I'll now need to do, the, the calling of the variants, the annotation, et cetera, et cetera. But now all of those different tools are stitched together. So you put in one input, you run it, and then you get a particular output, which is a bit more feasible. So these have uh, um, increased. But again, you have to be wary that um, some uh, pipelines and some databases might not are not well curated and maintained. So that maintenance of that database is also very important in uh, and curation is very important in these works. So I think it's about two minutes. Yeah, yeah. I think at that time when I, I wrote this, it was something that you version that just. That's yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's an example. So you, that's an example of a very good uh, database, which we, you know, which one can use. So we're going to get through Friday. Uncle Eddie and you know Maria will tell you that it's really for Quinlan, right? At molecular level in terms of the current drugs which we're doing, which is one drug. Okay, and people are on four drugs. So like I said, which one do you remove? How do you manage it? I am failing. And, and those are real problems uh, currently. So pretty much prior to this, that's what has been happening in country. With this, because you're now looking at the whole genome and the like from one, the proquinolin, everything is now rather a significant amount of drugs are now being covered okay so we have now got more information we can add you know which the clinicians can actually use in terms of managing the patients but bear in mind that just as was the case with rifampicin and the rpob gene in terms of rifampicin resistance whereby with more and more experiments being done one more information being provided. It is not yet a finished process. We still do get some instances whereby the database is saying that it is sensitive, but that phenotypic evidence is saying that it is resistance. But the more we do more of this uh, sequencing and the like, 
it becomes better and better. And eventually, it will reach a point whereby you are able to have uh, agreement between the molecular and the phenotypic. Go for it. No question. Yes. After this, I'll ask the question. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. I think here I just want to say that it's an ongoing process. And um, yeah, next slide. Okay. Those are just interesting papers you can look at. And also um, WHO. I think this was their second one, right? After that, yeah, yeah. But now they are also providing a catalog, which is important for us in the health sector because, and the Ministry of Health, should I say, because a lot of our things is sanctioned by uh, work, work at the WHO. So this is, I think, is a 2023 uh, catalog, which has just come out. And uh, next slide. Um, like on the Nestle, which is one of our core drugs, Okay, uh, they are providing, it's giving information on all, on all of those things. So these same mutations from the strains which you have uh, extracted and are going to sequence, you can have a look at those positions to see whether they are sensitive at, uh, or, or resistance. And this now, you know, can literally give to the clinician, which is going a long way. Because what we have seen, like some of the early results, we did do some sequencing. And already we have seen the dampening and uh, resistance coming up, but I already will tell you that everyone is being given the uh, And even when you are resistant, it's one of the last drugs to remove, but what is already is resistant. In fact, in some settings, you will find that um, even before the dampening was introduced in those countries, by chance, um, some a few patients were already bedaclin resistant. Okay, so NGS very very important. Yeah, next slide. Uh, so we're talking about the mother child. The mother child. So um, previously, for those who have had a molecular epidemiology and the like. In TB, who are uh, using a um, uh, variable number of tandem repeats, which we're looking at 24 loci. Basically, um, I think the easiest example is DNA, for DNA fingerprinting in humans. You know, you look at a set of uh, 15 to 24 markers, they look at the pattern. You're the father, yeah, definitely not the father. You are the criminal, you're not the criminal, the like. So we're doing the same for TB, and we're looking at 24 loci. Mm -hmm. And it, it was working to a certain extent, but with this, instead of looking at 24 loci, you are literally looking at the entire 4.4 million uh, bases in the MTP uh, genome. A big chunk of it, of course, is going to be the same, but the resolution is, with, like I said, within 10 base pairs. And so, the quest, some of the questions which are being answered clinically, this child resistance, how A, B, C, D, E, this can help to understand that. Additionally, we do sequencing, resistant, 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 what is going on? You'll find that they are all. I'm coming in the same person. You're already starting to think there's something going on in this community. In this community, we need to have such and such interventions. So those are some of the things which you can do with this whole genome sequencing. So we are building this up. We want to work nationally, collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we are. Next slide. Yeah, so that forms a part of that model. Like, like, oh, yeah. So one of the things, uh, like Lindsay has said, which we are trying to do is to strengthen, I think, yeah, the, the, the bioinformatics. I think what we have in Zambia right now is that sequencing instruments have been rolled out. We don't have enough people to understand that thing. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things which we can start with, but we really need to 
strength and uh, analysis uh, part of it. Like I said, we and the, everything I've said is not just for TV. Everything is A, G, C's, and T's. So in terms of how you are going to look at a lot of the things, I said it's going to be common across uh, your, your pathogens. So the way you think about it, what you can do will be very similar across that. That's about it. Thank you. Last question. Um, yeah, I was just going to add one to what the kid was saying. Like what, what you are learning to do, like during this um, time, it's not like, don't just think of it as something that can be used only for TV. These are universal like techniques that you can apply. With the kid that we're using, that was in music during the training, we've used it previously on granular sequencing and sequence. So it's literally the same procedure, and it's only the extraction that's different. So for TB, you have to use CTAB because TB has a very big um, cell form. So you have to you know, uh, develop that now. It's actually great to be, right? But for gram negatives, you can just get a guy to get off the shelf. You can extract the DNA, use the exact same kit, the exact same process, to get your results, right? And analyze. Obviously, the two spinomatics will be different depending on what bug you're using. For example, if you're using TB, TB profile, or what you're using. There are other pipelines that have been developed for other um, organisms. So what you're what you're learning today will be would be applied universally for any bug that you want to sequence in here. So, um, sorry. Yes, yes, even viruses. In fact, yeah. So the the rapid kit that we're going to be using, I used it to do for COVID. Um, during the COVID outbreak, we had a study where we had to sequence uh, COVID isolates. I used the rapid barcode kit for sequencing of the COVID isolates. Exactly, yeah. So basically, exactly. So it just the, the the process up to getting to where you're using the sequencing kit was different, depending on the bug that you're starting from. And you, if you go on the Oxford Nanopore site, um, it has um, uh, basically like a a flow a flow diagram like yeah, it takes you through right? yeah it, it asks you like what experiment you want to do, what organism you want to do and it takes you through and it tell you okay buy this kids and this is what you you know this is what you need to do so we can have yeah yeah so we can we can help you in that regard um, for other organisms but yeah just to think about it more generally in like what you can apply these techniques that you're learning to so it's not just TV, it's, you know, the whole bugs. You just need to kind of modify your protocol and you can sequence pretty much any. This might be the that we're doing is very much just preparing your DNA to be sequenced. It's adding to the barcodes or the primers and it's then adding certain proteins to yeah, what you put in and don't say it's to be any So this, yeah, this is quite universal. You just have to kind of work with the organism that you've got and if it has any kind of works like TV does, then you have to sort of <laughs> deal with that before you get to the sequencing, I think. With something like an ecoline, as I said, it's very, very easy. You can get loads of DNA from it. It doesn't seem to have any, it's got quite a sensible proportion of um, PCs and ATs, um, and it's quite easy to sense. If you have some B or say a very AT rich um, organism to know, then you have to think about how you're going to have that work. So uh, yeah, it's it's the before and bit that I think is sufficient.